Hello? Ah, testing. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, Bula, to uh, COP23, to um, Bonn. Uh, we're delighted to have you all with us today. Opening day, we have quite a nice room, actually, to, to kick off um, this COP23 and this uh, side event. Uh, um, very happy, also, that we were able to uh, organize this side event with the French Water Partnership. Um, and it was important for us to actually start the COP with this thought in mind of what would our world look like if we were reaching the four degrees. We've come to a moment where business as usual is not possible anymore. So there is a trend that is continuing. But at the same time, when you come to the COPs, you also hear about all the wishes, the stakeholders, the motivation, the desire, the will to move forward. But at the same time, it is accelerating and is a dying um, emergency to act differently. So the idea of this side event was to think, let's stop and think what it would look like if we were getting to four degrees, so the business as usual, but at the same time reflect on how and what kind of changes could be brought. And that is why for us it was important to look at the impacts of climate change when it comes to fresh water, cities, and oceans, because that is also where we can find solutions. It's having this integrated and holistic approach to the issues and problems, uh, and interlinking, uh, and not working in silos, but actually working collectively together. Um, I will be introducing this side event and moderating it also. We have a fantastic uh, panel, fantastic keynote speakers. Um, I represent CUE, which is the Stockholm International Water Institute. Um, uh, my name is Maggie White. I'm in charge of the uh, international policies there, and I'm also the coach of AGWA, which is an alliance for global water and adaptation. Um, and um, CUE is a water institute, um, but we leverage knowledge, uh, and also we convene the power in order to strengthen water governance um, for a just, prosperous, and sustainable future. We were founded in 1991. Uh, it's a non-profit, independent foundation, and we like to see ourselves as being neutral, since it's Swedish also. Uh, our vision is that uh, we can have a water-wise world. Um, and that means that we recognize the value of water in all its different dimensions, um, and that we need to have an inclusive way of sharing it um, and use it sustainably, equitably, and also efficiently for all. And for all is not only all citizens, but it's all stakeholders, it's all sectors, it's all disciplines. Because like we like to say, water connects. It's a bridge between all our different social, economic, and environmental needs. And our mission is to strengthen water governance so for a just, prosperous, and sustainable future. And when it comes to interlinking the stakes and the SDGs, we felt that it was important um, to actually have a source to see approach. And why a source to see approach? Why the need to actually create this platform, linking again to the issues I was speaking earlier about a water-wise management and a water-wise world? Um, it was important for us to create this source to see platform in order to document the environmental degradation that happens uh, from source to sea. It's also to look at the upstream and downstream effects um, and their connections. Um, because there's also that little, there's a double squeeze there for the deltas and the estuaries, uh, where they end up in this zone between the downstream pollutions. Um, and also, um, what is happening upstream doesn't always look into what's happening downstream. And therefore, looking at it, in a, as I mentioned earlier, in a global holistic way. Um, and in order to do that, and also look at that double squeeze, there's again this issue of governance. Um, we cannot continue working in a divided sectorial approach. Um, we need to link up with the other sectors and the other stakeholders. And that comes down to governance. Uh, when you're at the coastal level, you need to look at the city, the agriculture issues, energy, industries, um, human settlements. It's not just about cities, it's also about the more informal settlements that you can find too. From. And when it comes to the, the climate issues in that, uh, it's even more exasperated at that level. Um, and therefore, there's an increasing competition for resources, and especially for water resources. Um, and therefore, it's even more important to look at all the different trade-offs. Um, and what we often forget, us people from the freshwater world, is the impact that we have uh, on the sea and on the marine life. Um, 
And this is just a little um, scheme just to, just to illustrate the key flows that actually connect land, water, and oceans. Um, we have the, la the land system, the freshwater systems. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, that double squeeze that happens for the estuaries and the deltas. Um, all the issues when it comes to coastline as well. Um, and also um, the pollution that can come from the land going into the ocean. So we are at that stake of what happens if we are four degrees warmer by 2050. Yeah. What will be the impacts when it comes to the source to sea perspective? Um, we'll have stronger heat waves. Um, we have changing precipitation patterns, um, increased water scarcity, increased flood risk, and um, also tropical cyclones. I mean, we've been witnessing quite a few of them. But what's interesting also when you come to that source of sea level is that you have biodiversity and habitat loss, ocean acidification, and also damage to coral reef and ecosystems. And we often forget that oceans are also a source for mitigation because they do produce the oxygen, but also have an impact on the CO2. And of course, we have the sea level rise. Um, um, crop patterns will, will change, um, and of course, there's all these health risks. So the Source to Sea Action Platform um, uh, was launched at the World Water Week. Uh, this is also one of the, um, the activities that COE undertakes each year of doing a, a global annual meeting um, for water. And um, we have a growing membership um, of UN agencies, research institutes, um, NGOs, um, river basins, uh, and also um, small and medium-sized companies. Uh, it's really important also to associate the private sector in this dynamic, um, since they can also be a source of investment and solution too. Um, we act as a co-chair, uh, as a chair, sorry, and we host the platform. Uh, and anybody who's interested in joining the platform, you're very, you're very welcome. It's an open, um, dynamic one. So we're very proud that in this context, um, we're able to have, in the introduction of this side event, uh, um, the Nordic Council of Ministers, um, Trini Schmidt, who will be presenting a very interesting work that has been done about um, the bottlenecks or the issues when we're trying to reach the 2030 agenda. The report was published on that, and she will present more details on it. Um, and we're very happy to have Daniela Kroll, who's a senior um, policy officer at BMZ. She will be giving us um, the German perspective, but also linked to the different activities and corporations that they're leading in looking into interlinking these issues. Um, so I'd like to give the floor now to uh, Trina, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to uh, the Stockholm International Water Institute, as well as the French Water Partnership. It's a great pleasure to be here today to speak about what we do in the Nordic Council of Ministers when it comes to more broadly sustainable development, but of course also related to uh, SDG 6, which would be uh, the case of interest uh, in this case. My name is Trine Schmidt, and uh, I work with the Sustainable Development Goals in the Nordic Council of Ministers. Uh, and for you of, uh, who don't know that organization so well, that's the formal regional collaboration between the five Nordic countries. So that's Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Iceland. And then we also have the self-governing areas, so that's Greenland, Faroe Islands, and Åland. Um, in the regional collaboration of the Nordic countries, climate is, of course, one of the areas that's uh, very central. But aside from that, actually, we cooperate on everything from healthcare to education, uh, the only thing not being defense policy. We recently established a new collaboration on digitalization and on integration as well with the refugee uh, crisis. Um, so my work is placed under what we call the Nordic Ministers for Cooperation. And that's because sustainable development has to be a cross-cutting issue, as with the Sustainable Development Goals. So um, it's exactly this idea of breaking the silo thinking and working across. The Nordic Council of Ministers, although it sounds as one council, is actually composed of 11 councils. So uh, my daily day-to-day -day job is to work with all of these 11 councils on how we implement the Sustainable Development Goals. 
And uh, to be quite honest, that, that can be a challenge because people are very used to working within their council on whatever issue. Um, what's on the screen here is uh, oh, some work we had done for us in the preparation of our new uh, program on the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, although my communications people tell me it's not a very pretty uh, image, I think it illustrates very simply um, where we have the challenges in the Nordic countries. Um, often the Nordic countries are highlighted for how well we're doing when it comes to sustainable development, but I think it's very, on, it's very important that we have an honest approach in our work and shows that uh, we still have quite some way to go as well. So what this shows us is that you can see very simply uh, the red is the areas where we're not doing so well, uh, quite uh, easily understood. And uh, where our challenge is really is on sustainable consumption and production. So that's what we've put our main focus on in our, in our work. Uh, that has clear links uh, to many of the other SDGs. And although it doesn't show in uh, this mapping, which is based on international studies of fa how far we've come, uh, SDG 6 was actually continuously highlighted um, when we we're speaking about sustainable consumption and production. Um, so in September, we launched uh, our new program uh, where we work with the sustainable development goals in the Nordic countries. Uh, but prior to that, we spent a whole year of consultation with the civil society, with the private sector, with all of our minister councils, uh, where we asked them what is the most crucial thing we should work on in the Nordic countries uh, when it comes to sustainable development. And continuously we heard sustainable consumption and production. And we had highlighted that that is linked to gender equality, that's linked to SDG 6 on water, that's linked to uh, SDG 7 on energy efficiency, that's linked to our work environments, so SDG 8. It's very much linked, linked to both SDG 13 and 14. Uh, so that just shows how uh, we really had to think about how to work across. Um, yes, so I think um, my main takeaway is that it's been a very inclusive uh, process. Now the ministers adopted this program in uh, September and forward from here, uh, our balance is between working on all of the 17 goals while keeping on focus on where it hurts the most, which is our uh, sustainable uh, consumption and production. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Daniela, the floor is yours. Huh? Presentation. Yes. I just need it here. Sorry. Um, and okay. Yeah. Um, uh, honorable guests, interested climate community, I'm very pleased to be invited here as a speaker to this high ambitioned side event called Imagine Our World with Plus Four Degrees Celsius coping with the impacts of climate change on freshwater oceans and cities. Because who I am, I am only a senior policy officer for water in BMZ, the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, with a strong focus on the poorest of the developing countries. And um, when preparing this entry, it became clear that I need to start with an expectation management. And the center of the refle uh, reflect reflections is not so much an elaborated uh, plus four degree scenario, but rather reflections on how to cope with the climate change in these scenarios. Um, um, so what do we do? I am, you could say, a bureaucrat with a negative um, meaning with that. But we try to keep up to date with the latest trends, but we are not researchers. We are involved in international politi um, policy settings and uh, to bring this into action, transform this by local policies and sector policies. And Saturday and Sunday, for example, we had a pre-conference for this uh, COP23. It was called the Crossroad Conference. 
Uh, it was done by researchers, more or less, and it ended with 10 cornerstones, which said um, global corporations cannot succeed without justice and social cohesion, or technical breakthroughs and innovations are driving for climate transformation. Another point would be ensure adequate financing and so on. But how would we, the, the ministries, deal with these political framework, these political issues, and, poli and to bring them to, to guidelines and in, into action? Um, I need to link a look here. Ex extreme, if you have a look to, to a world with a pl plus four degrees, what we know from, from research, the first research results, is we would have to face far more extreme heat events. As we had in Australia in, at the 11th and 12th of February this year, it was in, in Celsius more than 45 degrees in, in uh, West Wales. And in the Gulf region, we, we, had, we, we had to face um, heat weaves above 50 degrees, and the worst was this year in India, 2016 in India, where you could say no normal surviving is, is even possible. And the, the prospect suggests that we will have to um, expect far more of these extreme heat waves. And today, this is what happened today when we have more or less an increase of one degree but I'm not a researcher, so please take me, don't cite me for these numbers. On the other hand side, this is uh, clear what, what, what is uh, the horror scenario is the impact on, on seawater. Um, the ocean uh, acid will, will increase by 150%. This has a strong impact on, on all life in sea, especially on the coral reefs. Um, they already have started uh, to, to dissolve. Um, but, um, but then, here we are, I'm a water uh, p uh, um, policy officer, I'm, I'm not responsible for the mitigation discussions. How, how, what do I have all to, to reflect? We have the human right agenda, which is very important. We have the, developing, the SDG Developing Agenda 2030 which is very new and brings together a lot of different goals and targets which have implications and, and not always um, um, each other helping implications um, uh, if you try to go just for one or, or the selected goals. Then we have the di migration agenda which is very important for all politicians in, 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 in Europe. And we have the Paris Agreement agenda. So how can we bring it all together? Especially if you consider that there is only a very limited amount of funding. Um, yes, and, and, and then w as, as input, all the decision makers have a lot of global maps. Here I, I, I show you just two, but there are many more. This is a map showing um, the rising um, strengths of water conflicts, how water conflicts can lead even into um, uh, um, war. Uh, or, so conflicts can be far lower and easily resolved, but they can be very strong, as in Syria, for example. And we see that there is a growing trend that groundwater storage is is uh, more under under uh, uh, danger. Um, all th there, there are many research institutes in the world that bring up a lot of maps. Other maps would show the the growing urbanization and all the the mega cities in the world. And we are expecting far more in the, the coming t uh, twenty years, thirty years. Need a lot of resources, especially water resources. So. Um, but, but if you bring all these challenges together, you, you try to find case studies or, or concrete examples. How can you start? And here I, I show you three very local and concrete scenarios. The one is taken from Fiji. They have extreme weather. That is, of course, heavy rain and a lot of flooding from, from, from rain. 
But on the other hand side, they have rising sea level and uh, the intrusion of seawater, so they are facing flooding and, and um, the, the drinking water resources become brackish b because of seawater intrusion. Then we have Zambia as an example. Here, the, the energy is security is threatened by climate change because the, uh, the uh, hydro uh, plants uh, are, um, have not enough water in it so that uh, the energy generators can't work um, uh, full time. And the last example is, is food security threatened. But in the very end, if you look deeper into it, how would I go and try to bring policies to help these? You come to improved uh, water resource management in, 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 the, in the background. And re this water resource management has to be done in the long term. So you need funding and support for, for at least eight, ten or, or longer years. And it's no short um, return of investment or political results you can, uh, you can aim at. Um, so, um, just a second. Um, our job as it's the decision makers or policy makers is to help societies to cope with several stresses at once. Sorry. Um, that is climate change, population growth, migration and displacement, and conflicts. And there is no single or easy answer. And it, it, you have to, to look very deep down to the, the single regions and, and population which, which, which are um, met by the risk there. So what is the best help? Um, um, especially if we think about uh, climate projection with this four degrees warming. And in, in the end, y you see energy losses through water scarcity, agriculture depending a lot of, of groundwater and depletion of groundwater. So there you need a good water management. Fiji has, has this, this uh, um, um, has to deal with grand groundwater desalination. So the solution is is a security, water security is a key enabler, even if you wouldn't see it in the first step. So it, it is difficult to go to a country which has a lot of water scarcity and tell them, um, um, and, and migration and, and displacement, that, that they should start with, with, uh, res with water management. Um, Now I come to the uh, source to sea platform, seawater. I'm sorry. Um, uh, seawater, joint water resource planning management is, transbound is transboundary and is not limited to fresh water. All the water management should also include seawater management. And therefore, the source to sea approach is very helpful and should be integrated. Um, Seawater is key for climate resilience, and oceans play an important role in regulating the climate climate. They release huge amounts of oxy oxygen into the atmosphere and absorb a considerable amount of the carbon uh, dioxide emissions. At the same time, the coastal ecosystems, like the mangrove forests in the tidal areas of tropical coastlines, absorb and bind three times or five times as much carbon dioxin from the atmosphere as purely terrestrial ecosystem. But to preserve these ecosystems means to manage uh, um, rivers, the, the flow from source to sea, and to have a look to, to, um, to the waste into uh, rivers. And that is maybe, and uh, um, BMZ is focused on marine litter when it comes to oceans. And um, we have organized with CV an event this year solving the plastic waste crisis in urban waterways together with the uh, MacArthur Foundation in, in Stockholm. 
Um, but we are so far not member of, of, of the source to see platform, and uh, we can offer what we can bring in or what we can support is, is good examples um, uh, with the International Water Stewardship Program, for example, in Tanzania, where we uh, help to, to clean the complete river and to support the water management that it's drinkable and, and can be used for different reasons. Um, yes, so far. Um, I hope the discussions um, bring the water community closer to the climate community. That is a huge gap we had in the last years. It was very difficult to speak to climate people and to, to, to bring understanding for the huge leverage they have if we work more in water. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. I'd like to call our last speaker, and then I'll open up the, um, to Q&As after the, the David, who, Salah Imelia, he's a researcher and head of the Climate and Large Scale Modeling Group, um, and also Météo France. Um, he would be um, giving us a keynote speech also about what would be the consequences of a plus four, with, I think, um, a, a global insight about it. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction. So, yes, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a climate scientist, so I hope you will forgive me if at times I'm a bit too technical, but uh, I will try to convey a few recent messages from research, including the last IPCC re report and a more recent literature about uh, global uh, water availability. So uh, even if I'm a climate scientist, I'm uh, aware that um, to assess an impact, a risk of an impact, um, actually this is the intersection between climate, in particular climate change and climate variability, uh, or extremes, for example, like precipitation or strong winds, cyclones, etc. And you, you assess the impact of some, th some climate uh, forcing, on some uh, medium, and then that medium has to be um, exposed on the one hand and vulnerable. And this is particularly true for water resources in the world. So first, uh, well, I begin with a complex scheme, which is the global hydrological cycle. This is just to say that um, uh, this is not as simple uh, to assess water resources as assessing the amount of precipitation that is falling. Uh, so you see uh, the big arrows, uh, downward arrows, which represent re precipitation uh, on land and ocean. These are very big um, fluxes of water transported between the atmosphere and land and the ocean. You have another big upward arrow, the green ar arrow, which is the ev evaporation. But actually, uh, even if... Um, precipitation may change under a, a scenario, a warming scenario of four degrees may change by as much as 10%, which on a very big figure here, everything, all the fluxes are in cubic kilometers per, per year. Uh, and re the re rectangles are the, um, in the different compartments, water compartments of the climate system. You have the stocks. But at times you can see that the stock can be very big for, uh, for the ocean, and the flux is relatively uh, small compared to the huge amount of water in the ocean. And on the contrary, which is more the, the topic of that talk later on, uh, you can see that the stock of water in rivers is really small. It's just two cubic uh, kilometers in total in, in the world. And the flux is much bigger than that, 45 um, 45 cubic kilometers um, every year of water that is discharged into the ocean. And here, something that is of interest for us today is um, apparently small figures. I cannot, I cannot really <laughs> see that very well from here, but uh, very small figures, which are, um, which is the human action on uh, these fluxes on the. Um, to take the water that we need for agriculture, for industry, and for uh, domestic use. In total, you can see the three figures in the, in the blue circle that I've designed here. In total, it's, we, we take about four 
um, cub 4,000 cubic kilometers of water every year in these uh, reservoirs, lakes and um, water in the, in the um, groundwater and rivers. And in the next slide, uh, I show you here from some UNESCO publication in 2001, which is still relevant today, how these 4,000 uh, cubic kilometers are um, sh shared between dif different sectors. You have a small contribution of domestic use, you have a contribution of industry, that's the green curve, and you have the biggest contribution, which is agriculture, which is, of course, key for, uh, for food and also to produce bioenergy and so, and so forth, and other, uh, other things we, want we, we would perhaps do in the coming years with agriculture. Um, and this is increasing since 1900. Incre this has increased a lot. The previous uh, slide was about the early 21st century um, water cycle. You can see that in 1900, the water extraction was much smaller. It was four times smaller than it is today. So, and it's projected to increase even more in the years to come. At first I said that uh, it's not as simple as just assessing how precipitation have changed uh, over the, um, the last decades here. This is, um, I, I show that to you anyway, that's the change in precipitation from different um, different observa observation data sets. You can see that there is an increase in precipitation in the northern, in, in the north of the northern mid latitudes. There is a, a trend towards um, decreasing precipitation in um, many subtropical regions, like for example the Mediterranean, and also in um, in Africa and um, and tropical regions, subtropical other subtropical regions, and. This has been showed already under a different form. This is um, the water shortage shortages that are to be expected, uh, that are uh, already seen, observed, you know, affecting four billion people now. Um, how to read that? Uh, when it's really dark and uh, dark red, maroon, it means that every month more water is taken for, from rivers and lakes than what is sustainable to maintain ecosystems in, uh, in the right condition. Even in regions where we would not expect that, like for example in the west of France, uh, in the big part of the west of France, you, during some months, a few months of the year, there is not enough water, we are, we are extracting too much water. And so, so now this is for, for the future. So at first I show in a plus four degree warming scenario, which is more or less the classical RCP 8.5 that we climatologists use, but this is more or less a plus four degree uh, for the end of this century compared to uh, 1986, 2005. Um, on top to the left, you have the change in precipitation, which shows more or less the same spatial pattern that has already been observed during the previous decades. But as I said, this is not when you, when models project that, that's a, an ensemble of climate models, you don't have the really the key to how future water resources may change. You have to consider as well, this is the plot. Um, at the top right, you have to consider evaporation. If precipitation increases, but evaporation increases more than precipitation increases, well, you are losing, the, the soil is losing water. Also, uh, at the bottom left, you have the runoff, which is the um, water running off on land surfaces. In some cases, when you have intense precipitation, an intense precipitation event, you may have a lot of runoff, but not much water infiltrating in the, in the soil. And to the bottom right, you have the soil mo moisture, which is not exactly the amount of available water. But you, you can see in the upper part of soils um, the trend that is simulated by the current generation of climate models. Here I make a comparison to show um, Actually, what is the difference between a plus two degree scenario warming and a plus four degree scenario? I think it's quite clear here. 
about projected irrigation water demand changes for the end of this century compared to the beginning of, of this century. But what, what is shown here, the, the, the work that was done by these scientists is that they used five climate models from CIMIP on which the um, uh, successive IPCC reports are based. And then they used these models and they coupled these models with global hydrological models for the plus two and plus four degree scenario. And you can see here that the picture is, is very clear that you have, even without any extension of cultivated areas, and without even taking into account the fact, the, the likely fact that uh, more food might be necessary for uh, mankind as a whole um, during this century, even if all this is constant, you need in many regions of the world in the plus four degree scenario, you need as much as plus 20, as 25 percent more water than now. And you can see that it's clearly much more than what you can see in the, I would say, a sustainable scenario. Um, so far, uh, I talked mostly about water resources, but we have to bear in mind that um, water can also co cause flooding. That's a recent study that I show here in um, three different scenarios. You see, can see on top the 1.5 warming scenario at two and four at the bottom. Uh, the risk of flooding is, cle is clearly much more important. The increases in, per in percent, so f plus 40 percent is the risk of the number of people exposed in the, these different countries is multiplied by four in some areas in the plus four degree scenario. So at the same time, the plus four degree scenario can cause water shortages in some areas of the world, but also in many areas of the world uh, can put many, many areas at risk of flooding. And so as a conclusion, um, it is confirmed, but uh, you, you probably all know that that the, the global water cycle has already changed and it will continue changing in the years to come. Um, the fraction of the world's population exposed to, to drought, but also to flooding <coughs> will increase with temperature. It's more, more people will be exposed in a plus four degree scenario than in a plus two degree scenario. And that alone, I think, is um, a motivation to reduce greenhouse gases emissions to avoid uh, serious impacts as much as possible. Water management will get increasingly difficult because uh, in terms of water, the, the change is, is, can be summarized as uh, rich gets richer. Regions generally that receive more water or which have a lot of water in, in the soil will have even more with climate change and semi-arid uh, or semi-desertic areas will uh, get even less water than uh, currently. Um, there will be an increased competition, but this has been said already, risks for conflict about water between countries, but also risks um, in, in some countries between different economic sectors, between agriculture, industry, domestic use, even tourism in some, uh, in some cases uh, where water can be used. Uh, adaptation is already taking place, but this will be increasingly necessary. Um, there are ways to, um, I would like to end up with a, a small message on, uh, on research. There are always uncertainties. In everything that I said here, there, there, there are uncertainties. But you, you have, anyway, quite clear pictures already emerging. So we have to be aware of these uncertainties. We have to be uncertainties. We have to be aware that even uncertain information has economic values for decision making, for informed decision making. And research is still needed. For example, for adaptation and better water ma management, uh, Meteo France and many other uh, research centers in the world are operating um, uh, uh, seasonal prediction models that can predict uh, water resources pre and precipitation, for example, um, as much as six months ahead, especially in tropical regions. And we, um, we are involved, many research centers are involved in uh, climate services activities for better water management. Like for example, um, the management of the 
Manantali Dam in, in Africa that has been uh, managed for years now with seasonal production products. That's part of the solution. And uh, so I thank you all for attention and I wish you a good conference. Thank you, David. It's, it's very rare to hear a, research, a researcher or a scientist actually say that uncertain information is just as important as certain information. So thank you for that uh, honesty also. And I, I like to think often, um, Einstein said that we can't find the solutions for tomorrow, tomorrow with the same mind frame that created those problems. Uh, so it's really about thinking differently, having a different mind frame. And when it comes to climate change, I mean, the impacts can be exponential, so we don't really know what's going to happen also. So we, we have to keep that degree of, uh, of uncertainty, I believe, in our, in our thinking. Um, I would like to, to open the floor to, to one or two questions before we go on to the, um, the panel discussions, where we will have some interesting um, case studies coming forward uh, from the Mediterranean, from the, the Pacific, uh, um, and also from Japan. Um, and um, I'd like to kick off with a question, since I'm the moderator, I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> and maybe I'll give you time to think about the question you'd like to ask uh, our distinguished um, panelists. Um, um, this is for the, the Nordic Council, actually. Um, uh, very often we have a way of thinking, and especially in development corporation, we're looking at the other countries. And what I think was interesting in the work you did, and especially in the SDGs, is that the question is addressed as much to our national issues that to our international issues. Mm -hmm. so, so my first question to you is, in your report, did you take into consideration the national and the international issues? Uh, and also, since water was seem SDG 6 seemed to be doing so well, um, do you take into consideration, if you do reach the targets of SDG 6, how can that improve your other SDGs? Uh, so, for example, um, improving waste and rejection of wastewater into the environment will probably improve the state of the ocean. So. I was wondering if you could give us a bit of insights about mm -hmm. how an improved SDG can actually have a domino or, or ricochet effect on the SDG, other SDGs, and will there be recommendations for you saying which are the most prominent ones to invest into? And my other question would be for, for Daniela also, who really made a strong plea for working together, um, and I would like her to maybe share with us how easy or difficult, or what could be some recommendations of how can we at the policy level, at the government level, enable the freshwater people to work more with the climate or with the ocean people also, which is one of the objectives that you're, that you're, you're reaching for. Those would be my two kickoff questions, but um, if there's one or two more in the room, I'd like to take them up, and, uh, and then our panelists can give maybe a, a wrap-up answer to them. Uh, yes, please, the man in the front. Uh, Please present yourself and your organization. Thank you. My name is Kwejo Brentio Osu. I'm from Ghana, um, Ministry of Energy. Um, the last researcher was talking about the fact that there's very little precipitation. And of course, um, the reason for some of these developments is that there's, there's development going on. There's, there's roads in the new areas that used to be forest. and so. We, we, we're covering the ground and we don't have water going down. And I, I want us to look at the solution to this problem in a much smaller way. You know, the bigger roads, construction of the roads and other things are controlled by the state, but individuals are building their homes that uh, individuals are in control of. And if there's any need for change, it's easy for an individual or small group to do that. So I was thinking about if you could suggest more innovative ways of um, building and to, to build our, our homes in a way that would allow more precipitation. Because if your home allows much more precipitation, and if mine and so many other people in the end, we have um, a big effect. Um, I want us to rather look at the small interventions coming together to have one big effect rather than tackling that huge um, aspect which is controlled by the states and politics that is sometimes very difficult to tackle. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Or? Okay. Oh, one. Uh, 
Uh, Ken Tessing uh, from Mary Nola Missionary Organization. I spent much of my life in Africa. But, uh, you know, I saw the signs, uh, the pictures there, the water towers of the world. In other words, the mountaintops that have so much ice and so on. I, I don't know if you've done it, any uh, research on that, but I climbed Kilimanjaro in 1980 and there were meters and meters of ice <laughs> at the top and now of course for years there's nothing. And yet they still say water is being absorbed and the rivers are running. Is someone can assure us that that might happen in the rest of the water towers that are soon no longer going to have ice caps? If there's no other questions, I think we'll ask the panelists to, to answer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, uh, both uh, very interesting. Um, if I start with the international national dimension, so um, the report you're talking about is called Bumps on the Road. I'm not sure if I mentioned that before. And that's a, a study that we did prior to figuring out how should the Nordic countries collaborate when it comes to sustainable development goals. And it's true that in that report we looked at uh, how are we doing now, where are we in the Nordic countries when it comes to sustainable development goals, and where do we need to improve. And it's also true that SDG 6 on water is currently green. Um, but um, it kept on coming up in our debates because, of course, you can't make this very clear-cut uh, only Nordic countries or international uh, dimension. So our program focuses on how to improve the Nordic region, but if we look at our consumption patterns, it's very clear to us that, of course, the way we consume in the Nordic region, especially when you speak about textiles, um, it has a great effect on other regions in the world. And I think uh, that's where, if you did a comparison for that, SDG 6 would not be green. It would be very, very red. Um, so our program is looking at how can we improve on uh, sustainable consumption and production in the Nordic region. Um, so that means that, yes, we are measuring the goals in our region, but it does have uh, a significant impact. And so uh, something that we're looking into now, but where we don't have a clear answer yet, is how we're actually going to um, illustrate that and look at our environmental footprint. Uh, so how can we as an organization that works in the Nordic region and we don't have a foreign policy mandate, we don't have a development aid mandate, uh, how can we still show uh, the, the impact that we have abroad? Uh, so that's something we're looking into now but we don't have an, an answer to it. Um, so I guess that was the first question. Um, another thing about uh, how the goals impact on each other. Um, we very much think that if we reach SDG 12 on sustainable consumption and production, that will have a very significant impact on the other goals. And here I'm thinking of uh, 13 and 14 specifically. Um, some of the things that the Council on, on the Environment, so that's where the Nordic ministers for the environment meet, uh, something they're very preoccupied with right now is microplastics and in general plastics pollution. So I think, um, of course, now we have these three colors and it's a very simple illustration and we have to be cautious of that, of course, because um, we still don't know uh, the full extent of uh, microplastics. Uh, it's only in the very beginning of it, so it might be that we're at a point right now where it looks uh, brighter than is actually the case. Uh, so, so I think our focus, um, given that we have 11 minister councils and we want to be able to involve all of them, uh, this broad focus um, on sustainable consumption and production is very much, if we reach that, uh, we reach many of the other goals and we make, make sure that SDG 6 stays green. Thank you. Daniela? Uh, thank you, Maggie. Uh, you were asking how can water people do better uh, when cooperating, uh, cooperating with uh, the climate uh, ministers, climate people. Um, first, I think we, we should make, uh, make uh, be, be clear where are the problems, why where are the problems in the cooperation between the water and the climate people. The problem is if if climate people come up with programs or investment ideas uh, to their local um, to their local governments, then very often they they, they cannot 
uh, get funding from the climate sources, and the climate funding sources are immense compared to what is available for water funding. And um, the main problem is that the water people do not really speak the climate language. What does it mean? They, they, would, not, they would not be aware in the way they, 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 they write their, their programs on what is the real climate-based the, the problem behind uh, their water scarcity or the water problem, the, the, the water infrastructure they, they are um, proposing, and what is man-made, what is the growing population, what is the, the worst reason in mismanagement. And it is m more or less always a mixture of these three or four uh, reasons. The, the fourth reason is different consumption patterns. And uh, only a part of all uh, water programs are really addressing climate change. They are always addressing different goals and different targets. So therefore, they're even better because they do not harm and they, they, they are helpful in many ways. And they, they help society to, to be sustainable and, and uh, for, for different uh, risks. And the other thing is they should include um, historical um, uh, data as, as, as much as possible and as local as possible. They can show that flooding or heavy rain or, dr or f fewer rain events have, have really a historic, uh, historical timeline. They are much more um, convincing than, than just with coming up with a water program. But I would like to include in my answer the, the, the question from this Mr. from Ghana. Uh, you were asking if there are uh, small interventions uh, in finding better buildings. Um, it seems from, from water perspective, it depends of if you're just asking for a single building, or a single household level, then of course it is more or less only the, the water re reuse aspect. How, so if how, can you use tap water again, let's say for toilet or for whatsoever, um, and have you included the sanitation, so the, 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 the wastewater treatment in all the planning if you're planning a village or a small community? So that is important and integral for any, any further results to include all the, the water treatment and the reuse of water as, as uh, effective as possible on a small scale. On, on a bigger, little bit bigger size, if you can uh, do planning on, on, on a basin level or even a small water well or water resource level, then you would bring together the, the poorest people, maybe the, the, the slum people living in, in, in the, the how, do, how do you call it, it's not, not planned urban areas, and, and the agricultural people uh, and maybe some big business, to bring them together and to help to, to, to find solutions where, so that they all agree that it's best for all that some areas are to be preserved for, for the water quality. There shouldn't be any buildings at all. And um, where the latrines and the, the water treatments plan should be based so that they won't uh, d um, hamper the water quality and all this. This can be done on, on a small, a, a, let's say, on a, uh, in parts of, of, of bigger cities. So it can be done um, decentralized. Yeah. Thank you, Daniela. David, would you like to add on something very quickly? And then we have to go on to the next uh, panel. Thank you. Concerning individual actions, so more generally, I would like to say that there is no small action versus bigger scale actions from uh, from states, for example. I think actions are really from individuals are really important, especially if they are organized through NGOs, for example. It's necessary for that to promote education for better practices and gender equality uh, in general. So that's what I, I could say. And concerning water resources, what I showed, um, global hydrological models are um, large-scale models, typically 100 kilometers resolution. And so 
we, we don't really see the Kilimanjaro or um, we don't really see the every valley, every glacier of the Alps and uh, we don't see, the, we don't model snow covers uh, very accurately in that kind of study. But there are also regional studies um, that show, for example, that in the Alps, uh, in 2300, if the t temperature warming is sustained at levels higher than three degrees, all the glaciers will disappear, and this will have consequences on um, river flows, on the seasonality of river flows, as well as of changes in precipitation that will fall less in the form of snow and more in the form of rain, contributing more rapidly to river flows and changing the seasonal cycle and water availability. So there, w there would be less water, for example, in France and in many parts of Europe due to that process, less um, water in rivers during the summer and a bit more in the autumn and, um, and a bit more also in, uh, in winter. Mm. Thank you very much. Let's give a big round of applause for our <laughs> panelists. Thank you. Thank you. So I would li now like to call uh, Monsieur Denis Lacroix from IFMER to join us, please, uh, as well as Ms. Stewie Shortland uh, from TACU, uh, Pacific Indigenous and Local Knowledge Center for of Distinction, and Mr. Shigenori Asai, Deputy Director of Japan Water Forum. Please join us. Thank you. So initially we gave you 10 minutes, but since we started a bit late, and I would still like to be able to give a, f a bit of Q&A, if you wouldn't mind um, just making your presentations a bit shorter, that would be highly appreciated so that the audience can also ask a few questions. Uh, thank you. For Monsieur Denis Lacroix? Yes. How is the Mediterranean doing? <laughs> uh, starting well. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we will have a focus not on the Kilimanjaro but on the Mediterranean. Um, I'm working in the, I'm in charge of foresight analysis at the scientific directorate of IFREMER, which is the French National Research Institute on the sea. Um, so it was, um, what I'm going to present is, um, is a collective work with a, a nucleus of uh, some research institutions, uh, about 25 uh, partners, uh, which is a huge work uh, for years. And it's, uh, in, in 10 minutes, it's quite difficult to, to present it, but I'll try to give the, the, the key ideas. Well, some figures about Mediterranean, because you are not maybe familiar with this um, sea. It's 1% of the world uh, ocean. Um, 46 kilometers of coast, um, about half of this coastline is um, a sedimentary coast, uh, so it's quite low level, uh, so quite exposed to um, sea level rise. Um, in addition to that, we can say that uh, uh, in most of the models, uh, in the Mediterranean, the increase of temperature is always higher than the average. So it's uh, one of the critical points. Uh, in case of, of uh, important uh, climate change. And uh, we have to say also that it's very artificialized, uh, notably because of uh, tourism. Uh, next uh, slide shows that if we, if we start with a temperature of four degrees, um, uh, this, uh, the average temperature of the 100 uh, depth uh, layer of the Mediterranean will increase by about one degree, which sounds nothing, and maybe if you are bathing there, you will appreciate, but actually it's very um, dangerous for a lot of ecosystems. Um, about the sea level rise, we, if we consider that uh, basically we should have at least one meter, and we may have some local differences, let's say between half a meter up to two meters. Uh, the pH will decreasing. Uh, you will have also, which is very important to underline, the fact that we are more frequent and stronger extreme e events. Uh, of course, we have spoken about that. Uh, higher water scarcity and risk of mega fire because of the dryness of the vegetation and the surrounding forests. 
and middle, uh, milder winters and hotter summers. So what is important to see is to shift from a picture to a film. So I, I draw these curves in order to show that, um, well, it's not e easy to, because if I go away. Okay, anyway, you will see the colors. If you can see the, the blue one, okay, which is called manageable. If, if we are coming from a point of uh, four degrees, uh, okay, thank you, it's easier. If you are starting from, well, mm. are you sure? Yes, it works here, <laughs> but it's reflection. Okay, it doesn't work. Anyway, uh, if we are here, you have four situations. Okay, either you are declining in terms of average temperature, so I would say we are saved. It's manageable situation. But you may also be on the point of leveling, which is already very alarming because four degrees is quite high. But, but you may also be on this uh, maroon curve, which means that it's still increasing, maybe slowly, but still. And the worst situation, of course, if you are on an exponential curve, the red one. So this is out of control. So keep in mind that in the four scenarios, there is only one which is manageable. So I don't want to stress you especially, but uh, I have to say that. OK, let's um, move to the places where you have in the Mediterranean specific uh, places where, which are very at risk. Um, well, we will not detail them. You can recognize in the north the, the, the plain of the Po, including Venice. We don't know what, uh, what to do with Venice, but also with uh, a lot of other spots. So several of them are huge uh, surfaces and people in, in involved. You can see also in this, uh, in this picture that um, we have a lot of vulnerabilities for towns and infrastructure. Uh, keep in mind that the uh, Mediterranean region is concentrating a lot of people, inhabitants, residents, that is to say shifting probably from 180 million people to quite the double at the end of the century, plus 300 million tourists, which is one third of the whole world tourism, which is supposed to in improve to increase up to half a billion at the end of the century. Okay, we'll see. And uh, of course, several impacts on the uh, multiple installation, 250 industrial areas, power plants, etc. I don't go into detail. I want to insist on this um, another drawing, just uh, concentrating all the risks that which are concentrating on the seashore, including what is very interesting for us, what's happening with water. We have been given um, figures about this runoff and uh, phreatic uh, sources. And we can see that progressively, if we consider that the sea level rise will be important, in half of the uh, surfaces, in half of the coastline, we will have severe problems with these resources. Uh, because you have to add, in addition, that this situation will be um, uh, more dramatic as there will be more and more extraction for pumping just for food and water security. OK, so plus of that, there, uh, there is a list, but we are in a hurry, so I don't detail cumulative pollution, invasive species, and vulnerability of hotspot of biodiversity, etc. All of these will be impacted by the fact that we are going to lose some of the wetlands, which are very important as a buffer against the um, extreme events. Let's take an example because you may think that the, the situation is quite uh, uh, gray, uh, but in some cases it may be an advantage. I take the example of the Nile Delta. You can identify here Cairo, which is uh, an important city, more than 20 million inhabitants. Just keep in mind that Egypt is 90 million people plus 1 million people every nine months. Can you imagine how you can manage this? Okay, so you can see the Suez Canal on the right and Alexandria on the left. 
The next slide shows what could happen if, we, if the sea level rise is up from one, only one meter. You can see the new coastline between the green and the blue. And uh, you are going to lose about, let's say, 450, uh, 500, 4,500 square kilometers of land, but height is very concentrated in the population. More than 6 million people will be directly uh, impacted, including big towns such as Alexandria, Damietta, um, Port Said, etc. So where are they going to go? Okay, so this is very, uh, it's a, a potential, e quite immediate stress to come. So one of the solution was to, um, to face against that, which is salinization, which is very powerful, is to transfer the, the problems of salinization of rice culture into aquaculture. And this was extremely successful. In 20 years, uh, as it is shown here, uh, the aquaculture in brackish water um, jumped from 50,000 tons in 1990 up to 1 million ton uh, in the year 2010, which uh, allowed Egypt to come into the top 10 uh, aquaculture producers. And of course, with, when you are producing shrimps and uh, uh, sea bass and sea bream, you can buy rice. So just finally, I would conclude on the fact that can we consider that Mediterranean could be a small-scale model for world issue at the end of the century? Yes, because we have a concentration of all the problems we'll have to face at a very big scale, on a world scale, I would say. You are able to concentrate them on the short territory with people who are aware of what is going to happen, who have some tools also to be successful notably because research is quite important and developed, not only, notably on the northern shore, but not, not, uh, not well, quite also in the southern part of the Mediterranean. So we have an opportunity to show that if we are sharing the knowledge, the knowledge we, and develop a high quality cooperation, we could be a sort of model for pro-action. Thank you very much. Wow, I'm relieved that from a terrible situation that it was turned into actually an opportunity. Thank you, Denis, <laughs> ending on a positive note. Um, Tui, Shortland, I know you always have wonderful, positive uh, stories to share with us also, so please uh, take the floor. Thank you. For Kia ora, everybody. Um, thank you for the welcome and thank you to the previous speakers for your very detailed uh, conclusions. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the indigenous responses to climate change. Uh, my organisation is called Te Kōpū. We are the Pacific Indigenous and Local Knowledge Centre of Distinction. So there are seven uh, indigenous and local knowledge centres, one each based in each indigenous region around the world. And uh, the purpose of our centres is to assist in the uptake of traditional knowledge into global decisions, particularly here at UNFCCC, as well as at UN uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, our purpose is also to share knowledge across regions. So uh, Te Kōpū, the name of Te Kōpū is after the morning star, or what we know as uh, Venus. Back around 600 years ago when Kupe uh, discovered Aotearoa New Zealand, when he returned back to the Pacific, he gave instructions to other Pacific relations on how to find Aotearoa, and he said to the right of the rising sun, to the right of the morning star. And so the elders named our centre Te Kōpū after that to assist other Pacific uh, nations to find our organisation so that we could assist them. Because largely what we do is help to raise visibility around our members' uh, issues throughout the Pacific and what they're facing, uh, particularly with climate change, as well as helping them to build capacity and share knowledge as well. So our organisation is uh, part of uh, a wider um, organisation as well. We have a school, we have six early childhood centres 
as well as uh, 500 students who are learning in our mother tongue. And uh, part of my uh, part of Te Kōpū's role is also to embed traditional knowledge within the curriculum of the school. So often we're also helping in other indigenous communities around education. Uh, in the Pacific, I'm not sure if you may know that we still have quite a large percentage of land tenure within the Pacific and ocean tenure, which uh, means that we also have a very strong cultural continuity. And we believe that that is our, our strength and uh, therefore that is what we uh, look to when we are seeking solutions to the impacts that uh, the Pacific communities are facing at the moment. So uh, things like the traditional lunar calendar is still uh, commonly utilised in many communities, including my own. Uh, often around winter, when we consider the new year to be, there, is, uh, certain, there are certain stars that rise above the horizon. And they are linked to, say for example, Puanga. And they are linked to uh, so signs that are going on on the land, such as the flowering of vines, like the Puanga. And so when we see these signs, we also look to the stars to see how bright they're sparkling. And that gives us an indication of what kind of harvest we will have in autumn. So we're often looking at forecasting what the earth is telling us and seeing how we can adjust to these signals. And we believe that these ty this type of traditional knowledge that is throughout many indigenous communities uh, can continue to offer solutions and join uh, and have synergies with, West with other science and other knowledge systems in these um, conversations. So uh, we have members uh, of Te Kōpū that are based all around the Pacific, uh, from Kiribati, Tuvalu, uh, uh, Maluku, Papua New Guinea, West Papua, Australia, Tonga, Fiji, all over. Um, all of the members are Indigenous Peoples' Organisations and they're all working on environmental initiatives within their communities. Say, for example, in the Cook Islands, they are working on coral reef restoration and reseeding. In Fiji, we have CC Initiative, who are based in a small island, uh, isolated area, who are a previous Equator Initiative recipients, and they uh, have been recognised in their restoration of endangered species. Uh, in Tuvalu, we are working with a youth organisation who are working in mitigation and adaptation to climate change. In Tonga, we're also working with uh, another member who utilises traditional knowledge in emergency responses uh, to climate change events. Uh, we also have members in the Solomon Islands. So part of the message, and I'm really glad, of course, that Fiji is hosting COP this year, because we're trying to, uh, you know, convince people that this is immediate and urgent what is happening uh, to many communities already. In my own country and back in Aotearoa, New Zealand, a lot of people still think that climate change is not going to happen for another 50 years, you know, and it's not affecting them. But say, for example, in the Solomon Islands, we already have had five archipelago uh, submerged completely by water. Uh, so to look at solutions, we're here as an indigenous caucus uh, to further discussions around traditional knowledge that was included in the Paris Agreement. And then at, in Marrakesh last year at COP22, uh, the establishment of the Indigenous Peoples Platform. So this year we're looking, uh, we, we're currently talking with state parties about the oper operationalisation of the Indigenous Peoples Platform. How can we enhance Indigenous peoples with a participation within decision making of COP? So uh, we look to you as our allies as well uh, to try and um, assist us in this discussion this week. Uh, negotiations have already started today. And um, one last thing before I finish, I don't want to take up too much time. If you are interested in some of these initiatives that are going on in the Indigenous communities, we would be happy to share and link you to those. 
and also we have newly established uh, an indigenous global platform called Native XP and uh, it's very much like Airbnb but you have indigenous hosts and you can go into the communities and have an authentic experience and learn about some of the really positive things that are going on. Uh, next Tuesday, we'll be having a side event on that. Um, so come along, keep an eye out for that. Thank you. Thank you, too. And also reminds us about climate justice when it comes to indigenous. I mean, very often these are the people that cause the less effect on climate and are the ones that are suffering the most, too. So. Thank you. Um, Shigenori Ashi, please, if you'd like to um, share with us your experience from Japan Water Forum and the States in Japan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, to speak about the cases of adaptation of the Japanese coastal cities. Uh, the, in Japan, uh, the uh, 60 to 70 percent of population live in a coastal area, and also the 90 percent of property uh, is uh, concentrated on this uh, area. So uh, the uh, major cities, uh, almost major cities, uh, were uh, located in this coastal area. So uh, it's it's very uh, coastal area is uh, uh, maybe the risky area. So the adaptating climate change is very important for Japan. Uh, I, uh, I would like to uh, brief about uh, the my organization, Japan Water Forum. Uh, the Japan Water Forum is a multi-stakeholder platform in Japan. Uh, we link uh, the, the stakeholders in the field of water, such as the government, uh, private sectors, and uh, academia, uh, to uh, and uh, we work collaboratively with them uh, to address the global water issues uh, as well as uh, domestic water issues. So in Japan, the uh, government uh, decided the first climate change adaptation plan in 2015. Uh, this plan was uh, based on the, the assumption that the average temperature would rise 1.1 degrees if uh, intensified measures uh, against the global warming were to be implemented, and that uh, the average temperature uh, would rise 4.4 degrees uh, if massive greenhouse gases were emitted. Uh, this uh, plan uh, indicates the basic direction over the coming decade uh, while considering the long-range outlook until the end of the 21st century. Uh, it is expected that the risk of uh, frequent uh, occurrences of water rate disasters will increase uh, due to climate change. Uh, however, uh, based on the idea that there are uncertainties about the prediction of future impacts of climate change, such as time, location, and extent, the prime is unique in promoting flexible management and allowing us to uh, choose timely and uh, appropriate adaptation measures as necessary while monitoring the uh, impacts of climate change. In Japan, it has already uh, been observed that occurrences of heavy rainfalls are increasing. Uh, disaster prevention measures uh, implemented Against three obvious phenomena can be regarded as part of our adaptation measures. Sorry. Uh, in the government's adaptation plan, uh, it is uh, stated that not only the national government but also municipalities should promote adaptation measures. The law requires local governments to develop uh, an implementation plan regarding the mitigation. But uh, uh, they are not obliged to prepare plans regarding uh, adaptation 
unfortunately. Uh, on the other hand, in 2016, the central government unveiled guidelines for local governments to develop uh, their climate change adaptation plans for plans. Uh, since then, the many prefectures and large cities have been developing adaptation plans. Some have tried to incorporate impact assessment and adaptive measures into their existing implementation plans. Uh, regarding the uh, expected impacts of uh, climate change, uh, it is uh, vital in formulating the adaptation plan. Uh, some local governments utilize existing meteorological information uh, provided by the central government, uh, central government uh, while others, Fukushima Prefecture, uh, for example, uh, conducts uh, uh, predictive uh, simulations on their own. At present, and, uh, a model for forecasting the future climate change at the local government level has not been developed, uh, so it is necessary to convert uh, predictions made at the global level to uh, local level. The city of Yokohama uh, developed the basic strategy. Uh, they are promoting uh, measures to pre protect the lives and the property of citizens and improving resilience of the city. Also, they uh, identify the uh, role of citizens, uh, businesses, and the governments. The Yokohama city is uh, planning to formulate uh, sectoral policies. Uh, for example, uh, water resources and the water environment are taken into account in the area of agriculture and uh, na natural environment. Uh, they uh, also plan to uh, monitor the level of uh, river and the tide and to take the countermeasures. The besides, the city is also uh, planning to conduct uh, assessment of the impacts on in the industry and the economy. Uh, particularly in the area around the Yokohama Station, it aims to develop the public storage systems uh, capable of responding to rainfall of 70 millimeter per hour, this is occurring once in 30 years, and to promote the construction of rainwater storage, uh, rainwater storage facilities uh, by uh, private, private companies uh, capable of responding to rainfall of 82 millimeters per hour uh, this is occurring once in uh, 50 years. Uh, I would like to uh, speak about some more uh, example, but uh, only I would like to uh, talk about only one city. Uh, in the city of Kawasaki, uh, priority measures are being prepared, uh, taking into consideration the central government's adaptation plan, as well as uh, residents' opinions and the local characteristics. The city's adaptation efforts include uh, various measures uh, against the flood control, infection, heat stroke, and etc. Et from the perspective of the promoting industrial development, the city supports uh, business operators' efforts to uh, maximize the envir environmental technology towards uh, adaptation measures. Uh, this is an uh, example in uh, Aichi Prefecture. Uh, this uh, water gate is uh, located uh, at the border uh, b between uh, sea and the river. Uh, uh, so this uh, water gate on the Nikko River has been improved in order to respond to uh, the sea level rising uh, due to climate change and uh, ground subsidence over wide areas. Uh, support and the foundation and part of the gates, uh, these gates, uh, uh, gates uh, which are difficult to uh, rebuild will be improved uh, by considering the future sea level. Uh, gates uh, itself, uh, which uh, e are easy to replace, will be improved step by step uh, in response to uh, sea level rising. Uh, this is an example of a flexible approach taking the uncertainty of climate change, climate change impacts uh, into consideration. 
dams in the uh, dams in the upper stream play an important role in flood control in coastal areas. In many cases, the area of the dam body is larger in its flood. Uh, therefore, the storage capacity can be effectively increased by heightening the dam. And the function of the flood control uh, can be easily increased. Uh, dams are useful for both adaptation and the mitigation of the climate change uh, because they can be also used for uh, power generation. Uh, in fact, uh, there are limitations to structural measures. And so the improvement of non-structural measure is also underway. A revision of the Flood Fighting Act in 2015 introduced new measures. The government must disclose information on potential inundation area that could be affected in the event of the largest scale river flooding and inland flooding and storm surges. In order to respond to Inland flooding and storm surges, a new system has been created to inform residents of the risk of inundation, depending on water levels in storage systems and the coastal areas. Uh, finally, I uh, would like to speak about uh, international uh, collaborative actions. Uh, Japan uh, gives uh, assistance to the high-level experts and readers panel on water and disasters. Uh, they are uh, considering uh, principle uh, on investment and financing for uh, water-related disaster risk uh, reduction in order to promote uh, investment in disaster, pre uh, disaster prevention and uh, disaster preparedness. And last uh, but not least, uh, this December, uh, the third Asia Pacific Water Summit is to be held water disasters and the climate change is one of its major themes. In the Asia Pacific area, mega cities are co concentrated in coastal areas and rapid urbanization has increased the level of vulnerability. Also, we have a lot of islands uh, in this area, uh, in this region. I hope today's outcomes will complement the discussion at the South East Pacific Water Summit. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. We are over the time of our session. If I, what I suggest is that we give the floor to uh, Philippe Guettier from the French Water Partnership to give us his concluding statement and invite you all to uh, reach out to the panelists uh, afterwards to ask them their, your questions. Um, Thank you. Philippe, the floor is yours. Yes, th thank you, Maggie. I have to be very short. I will be sh very, very short. Two minutes. Uh, I listen here only one message. You, we don't want a scenario on plus four degrees Celsius. We, you don't want this scenario. It's not a valuable scenario in regards of political, geopolitical, economical, environmental issues. It's not possible. It's not valuable. It is the only message I noticed there. You're welcome on next Friday for the Water Day, uh, which will be held here in uh, Bonn Zone, all the day to listen on the activities on the states and other actors involved in the water issue to know exactly what happened. But if we try to notice something today, we don't want this scenario. Thank you. And sorry, I am Philippe Gettier, the general director of the French Water Partnership. It's a French platform, public and private, who advocates in water issues, especially in uh, link with uh, climate change. Thank you. 
Well, that was very short, very rare for French people to do shorter than what was expected, but thank you, Philippe. Thank you, everybody, for staying with us, and I please, I invite you to come and speak to our panelists uh, if you have any questions to address to them. Thank you. Bye-bye.